Yo, what's up, y'all? Welcome back to UndergroundWellness.com. First off, I gotta say thanks so much for the birthday love yesterday. There were like countless tweets and emails and Facebooks. Really, really cool of you. I just felt totally loved, so thank you very much for that. As promised, we are talking today about the book Wheat Belly by Dr. William Davis, MD. I love that, because very seldom do you have an MD who's actually talking about this type of stuff. Um, he and I did a phenomenal radio show a couple months ago. I'm going to go ahead and put the link right down there in the info box. Definitely check that out. And I actually did a blog about this. It was called These Ain't the Same Grains a couple months back. And today's video is like the video rendition of that because more people need to know about this. Now, when I talk about food, if you know me, you know I always have this one argument. I have many arguments. My main one is, hey, how does an old school food cause a brand new disease? And when it comes to grains, like people will see my videos, like there might be one called hating on grains and there's a few others out there because there's many reasons to hate a lot of grains. Um, people will say, well, hey, you know, grains are in the Bible. You know, it's a staff of life. Wheat goes way back, I mean, 10,000 years. Now, it didn't cause any problems back then. And why is it causing problems now? And I go, well, all right, let me show you something. You know what I'm saying? Because we are not eating the same type of grains. The grains have changed significantly over time, and that's what I'm going to show you today. Now, first off, we're going to go back. We're going to go way, way, way back to 8500 BC. And where are we going? We're going to the Fertile Crescent. We're going to, like, the area where, like, Israel and Syria and uh, Iraq are, right? And we're going to talk about a particular people, a hunter-gathering people called the Natufians. And they hunted and they gathered, but they also harvested something called Einkorn. Now, einkorn is one of, the, if not the earliest form of wheat, it's one of the earliest forms of wheat. Very, very, very simple plant. Only 14 chromosomes. They didn't bake it. It didn't have all these baking characteristics that wheat has now. They weren't making biscuits and muffins and things like that. They ground it by hand and they ate it as porridge. Very, very simple, right? Now, what happened is that when einkorn was cultivated, it went ahead and got itself a girlfriend. And that girlfriend's name was goat grass. And goat grass also had 14 chromosomes, was rather simple. And they were together for a little while and they made themselves a baby. And that baby's name was Emmer. Now Emmer has 28 chromosomes, a little bit more complex. And I'll tell you why this is important in a second. So 28 is that 14 plus 14 equals 28. Kind of add on top of each other. Now, emmer is very likely the wheat that's talked about in the Bible, that staff of life. However, we don't really consume emmer. And but, you know, I actually missed a point earlier. When we're talking about grains, I'm just going to focus on wheat. And the reason why I'm going to focus on wheat is because 99% of the grains that we consume are wheat. We're really not eating like rye and, and uh, spelt and kamut and barley. We just pretty much eat wheat. You know, go through, the, go, go through your supermarket. Pretty much everything has wheat in it. Anyway, so again, this is likely what Moses was consuming. Around those biblical times, Emmer got itself a girlfriend or a wife, I should say, just to be politically correct, got itself a wife named Triticum something. I can't even pronounce that. 14 chromosomes, 28 plus 14, made a 42 chromosome baby named Triticum astevum. Now, this is the wheat that we consume now, okay? Triticum astevum, it, it is what it is, and I'll tell you in a minute. Triticum astevum is, is the most recent, and it stayed pretty much, you know, intact for thousands of years. But then, in the mid-18th century, there was a count done, and there were five varieties of this triticum acetum. And that's cool, there was just five. But now what do we have? We've got 25,000 varieties. How did that happen? Of course, that didn't happen just by nature. We had some man-made intervention going on in there. We had some science going on up in that deal for sure. Now, this all happened by way of hybridization. Now, we have to understand here, we went back to 8500 BC and went all the way up to the mid-18th century with very little change in the wheat. Now, in the last 50, 50 years, wheat has changed considerably. The wheat that we consume now is probably not the same wheat that your grandma consumed when she was a little girl. Completely different. Why? Again, through hybridization. 
Why did they hybridize the wheat to make new varieties? Well, there's actually some very honorable reasons why they did that. Why? Because it made the wheat more drought, heat, and cold resistant. Very, very good. They increased the yield. If you're a farmer out there, of course you want to grow crops that have a very good yield. And really what's most important here is that they wanted to fight world hunger. Very, very honorable. And of course they wanted to give us some better baking characteristics. They wanted to be really, you know, doughy and pliable and twistable and make all kind of cool treats and whatnot out of them. But you know, leaving this one out, all this stuff is really, really cool. Helped a lot of people. But at the same time, they said, well, you know, it's just hybridization. We probably don't have to look to see how safe this is and how it affects human beings and whatnot. Now remember, in last week's series of videos, we talked about milk. And remember, it was that 67th spot on that peptide, that single amino acid, that single change in amino acids that completely changed the way that A1 milk works inside of your body, maybe causing some harm. Very, very, very little thing. Now what happened here was that they didn't think about that with the wheat. And so when they were doing these hybridizations, you know, they would have one parent and another parent, and then they had the baby, right? A new variety. And they were finding that the baby was having genes for gluten proteins that trigger celiac. Okay, that's not a good thing. Didn't exist before, now we're making it through man-made hybridization. This is not your staff of life. Absolutely not. Furthermore, I was talking earlier about the chromosomes and whatnot. Now, how do you make wheat more, you know, why do you, how do you give it more better baking characteristics, I should say? You have to increase the gluten. The more gluten, the, the better it's going to be as a bread or as a pretzel or as, a, you know, whatever you may buy out there. 14 chromosomes, not a whole lot of gluten going on in there, okay? Now get up to 28 with the emmer. You've got more gluten there. And now you've got the triticum estevum with the 42. Now you have a more complex wheat. You've got even more gluten there. Now check it this out. A genome with einkorn. Emmer has A and B genome. Triticum estevum has A, B, and D genome. That D. The D genome is what the scientists work on when they're doing the hybridization. That's what they're targeting. Why? Because the D genome is what is going to confer those baking characteristics. However, at the same time, we see that that D genome is the source of the gluten proteins that trigger celiac disease. So we've got a completely different grain. And this is why I say, these ain't the same grains, you know what I mean? In old school food, isn't supposed to call, cause a brand new disease. And the reason why it's causing some new issues is because this ain't the same food that they ate in the Bible or before. This is brand new. Again, probably not even what your grandmother consumed. And so keep this in mind, check it out. Um, don't believe me, I always say that. Do your own research, pick up the, the book Wheat Belly by Dr. William Davis, uh, check out the radio show that we did, it's gonna be down there somewhere, do your own research. Uh, undergroundwellness.com, uh, pick up my book, Dark Side of Fat Loss. Um, I'm out of here, I will talk to you guys tomorrow. Peace.